Good morning. Good morning. I make it a habit of training non-minority congregations <laughs> on how to engage a sermon. So I'm going to give you a few things you can do this morning with the caveat. If it's real good, you say amen. If you feel convicted, shake your head. <laughs> give a deacon hum, deacon hum. Mm. Now, one third of my congregation is white and Presbyterian, so I do understand that some of you must amen by taking notes. <laughs> and that's okay too. I want you to know there's freedom here in the gospel. There's freedom in the gospel for everyone. All right? If you have a Bible, uh, open up to 2 Peter. I'll give you a chance to get there. 2 Peter chapter 3. Dr. Aiken already gave me uh, quite an introduction that I certainly do not live up to, so I won't say much more about myself beyond that. When you got it, say, I got it. Let's read this together. Second Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? That's important. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. You need to underline that. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward who? You. Patient on your account, some translations say. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. If you'll pray for me, I'll pray for you that God would... Help us receive the gospel this morning. Heavenly Father, who am I but a man? You are the living God. I pray that you set me aside this morning. Have me to vanish behind your glory, behind your grace, behind your majesty, behind your goodness. And please now, Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds, particularly as pastors and leaders, to receive this word from you to receive this word through your apostle Peter that the end is coming and that there are many we love who will be on one side of the renewal or the other give us grace to carry the gospel until then in Christ's name and all the redeemed said <laughs> who here intends on being a pastor or a lead pastor someday raise your hands this is especially important for you and I don't want you to miss that. It's very easy in the pastorate to get inculcated in Christian world, to fill your time with Christian people, to exhaust your energy on extrapolating Christian truths to preach to Christian congregations so that Christians may be entertained by your homiletic expertise. But there's a greater call on us 
And I want you to know that everything that I'm about to say to you, I say in love, I say with a similar conviction because it's been a struggle of mine for these 12 years that I've been in ministry myself. Peter is very, very clear, very, very clear in the latter part of this letter that uh, the, the great hope, the great expectation that we have of the return of Christ is coming. We should rejoice and we should celebrate. But in that, I believe there should also be some mourning. Because there are those in and around us when this renewal comes that will not experience that renewal. Not unless we are ardent, vigilant, vigilant about carrying to them the gift that we have received by grace through Christ Jesus. And that is the good news of the gospel. You see, we, we have a tendency to believe that the world is always going to be as it is. We don't say that, but we wake up in our routines and we wake up in our rhythms and we wake up in our practices and we wake up with our progress and we wake up with our idea that it's always going to be this way. And it's not. Midnight last night, the the government shut down. I don't intend to unpack the politics of that, but I I think it's a wonderful example of how several thousand people's reality shifted all at once. This morning, New Yorkers woke up without the ability to go to the Statue of Liberty. Those in St. Louis woke up without the ability to visit the arts. Those in D.C. woke up without the ability to visit the Washington Monument. And 800,000 people will not be paid who have children and families. And I imagine up until that moment, up until that very moment, it did not cross their mind that somehow their reality could shift so suddenly, somehow their reality could change so swiftly, somehow this giant entity that makes our functional lives turn from day to day could suddenly be at a standstill and that it could affect so many to the tune of a billion dollars a week or 55 billion if it drags on beyond that. The point is this, time is not waiting for us to decide that we're going to be faithful to the call that rests on our shoulders. And we cannot be dependent on the false sense of security in which we exist, that we're going to wake up and things will always be as they are. Allowing monotony to cloud our vision and to cloud our understanding of the coming of Christ and all that it means. Not just for those of us who will celebrate it, but for those of us and those that we know who will suffer because of it. You see, if you're a Christian, you believe the truth of the gospel, you believe the truth of God, you believe that God is going to return to the world, and when he does, it will no longer turn as it has. And when that happens, all the people that we love and know who do not love and know God will cease to have an opportunity to ever do so again. That's what's so fascinating about this passage. For years I read it believing that it was written to unbelievers until somehow, thank you Holy Spirit, should have had a V8, uh, 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 it, 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 it jumped off the page a couple of years ago that he's writing to believers. He's writing to the church. In chapter 1, he explains uh, uh, what it means to, uh, to make sure of their election and their 
calling and the practices that should uh, habituate that calling. In chapter 2, he attacks false prophets and, and the false truth that is trying to permeate the church and trying to dissuade weak believers and trying to draw them away. And then in chapter 3, he gets down to the nitty-gritty that Christ is coming. And not only should you make sure of your own calling and election, but you should be about the business of an evangelist. Because the world is not going to always turn as it has. Listen, we're just going to walk through this verse by verse, and I want you to see what's going on here. Starting in verse 1, Peter writes, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. First, we have to ask ourselves, as we've already addressed, who is Peter writing to? Who is he talking to? Who is he calling beloved? He's calling them Christian. He's, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to those who have received the good news by faith, who have received Christ's righteousness through grace, who have been filled with the Holy Spirit and who should understand the calling on their lives. He goes on to say that in this letter he's trying to arouse or, or, or stir up their sincere intention by reminding them that they should remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. What words, what commandments? He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about Jesus himself promising a day when God will return to, to claim what is his, a day when God will purify what is defiled and mend what is broken and restore what is shattered and make new what is now shamefully misrepresenting what he once called very good. Peter is calling them to remember this truth. As Christians, we wait based on promises for God's glorious coming. But the emphasis here is that those who are followers of Jesus do not wait passively. We don't roll ourselves up in a grace blanket and, and, and sit back and hope that God will come tomorrow. That was your cue. Because we're all guilty. As long as God's got me in mind, I'm all right. We're all guilty. We don't wait passively. But you have to ask yourself, why such an emphasis on those who have already believed? Why? Because our tendency, as we've already said, is to believe that things will always be as they were. Our tendency is to treat every day as the one before it and not cultivate each opportunity as one in which we can glorify God. We've all been guilty. And when we fall into this lifeless, routine-driven faith, we leave ourselves open not only to all types of influences, but we leave ourselves open to unfaithfulness with the gift that we've been given. We make ourselves susceptible, Peter says in verse 3, to scoffers. We make ourselves susceptible to unabashed lies and deceptions. We make ourselves susceptible to drifting away from the truth that we believe. Susceptible to, to falling into the traps of those who, verse 4, say, where is the promise of his coming? Now, if you're honest, you've had those conversations, at least I hope you have, where people challenge what you believe, people challenge God's return, where people challenge the truth of the gospel. And if you're not firm and sure, Peter says that you can just as easily be drawn 
away because it plays into our own insecurity with our faith. But Peter assures them that is not true. Don't you think for a second that God is not intricately involved in the working of this world? And that those who dismiss this fact, verse 5, look what he says there. Overlook that the heavens and the earth existed long ago. That it was formed out of water and by means of water, per Genesis 1. And God created all that we see. And then Peter further reminds them that, that specifically in the time of Noah, The same waters that God used to form creation, the same waters that God used to shape this reality, the same word that he used, he used to destroy the very thing that he made. The world had become so thoroughly poisoned with self-worshipping people who hated God and did every evil thing that they could imagine that God intervened. And through his word, the world of that time came to an end, deluged by water and covered by water. You see, we are in the second age of that world. I need you to see this. We're in the second age of that reality. The world that Peter's talking about now that is being stored up for fire. And if we believe for one moment, if we allow ourselves to to relax and and to to sit back on our laws and allow ourselves to drift from the fundamental understanding of God's return, then, then we forget that when this happens, though we celebrate on the other side of it is great unpleasantness for others. And this should grieve us. It should grip our souls. It should weigh on us. I remember the first time that I heard the gospel. I remember the great relief it was to understand that God's desire, which we'll get to here in a minute, was not to wipe me off the planet. That God's desire was not to spend eternity separated from me. That God's desire was was not to cut me off from his promises. That God's desire was not to leave me in my unredeemed state. That God's desire was not to leave me out of the new kingdom. That God's desire was not to rejoice over my perishing. But if you don't remember that moment, if you don't, if you don't uh, allow that to, to soak and permeate your soul on a daily basis, if you don't understand the fact that, yes, grace was free for us, but it was not cheap for God, and if you won't live with a constant reminder, a constant reminder that the great majority of those whom we encounter on a daily basis will not will not see God's face. Without your faithfulness to proclaim his goodness. And you can't say that you're faithful to the gospel. Now that's harsh, if that's that's harsh in your buzz, I apologize. But far too long, far too long the church has been in a defensive maintenance posture. Far too long we 
we have waited for the people who don't understand grace and don't understand truth and don't understand redemption to fix themselves up enough to wander into our buildings. Then we'll get them saved. And I believe, I believe it's because we've lost sight of this reality that God is coming back that God is coming back. And we sing about it and we celebrate it and we clap about it, forgetting the fact that when he does, my grandmother will have nothing to celebrate about. And I'm sure you have a wealth of family members that are the same. Let's wrap this up here. Because I need you to see God's heart for the sinner. Verse 8. Peter says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved. After everything he's already said, he's reiterating that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. You know what he's saying there? It could be tomorrow. It could be this evening. It could be in the middle of our closing song. It could be in this moment that the sky will break. And the world as we have known it will cease to turn that way. It could be in the span of a breath. And all all that we know, all that we know will be over with. Everything. Gone. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, patient on your account, not wishing any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Ezekiel 18, 23. God says that he finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says it again in the same chapter. Peter reiterates it here in 1 Peter 3. What do you think the point is? Why are we not grieved like God? If our hearts were grieved, we could not sleep without sharing the gospel. If our hearts were grieved like God, we could not go another day, go another moment, go go another second without sharing the good news for those who are going to be lost and perish forever. our hearts were grieved like God's. But God knows us. So he gives us time. He gives us grace. He said, I haven't been been slow to fulfill my promise. I'm waiting on you. Because the thought, the the very thought of, of, of losing any portion and any part of what I breathe life into and what I breathe breath into and what I formed in my own image, though distorted by sin and distorted by brokenness, I made them. And the thought of losing one of them causes me to slow it down so that you will be faithful with what I've entrusted to you. Are you grieved like 
God over the state of the lost. I would wager to say if not, it's because you've lost sight of the fact that God is coming back. He's coming back. And he's not going to rejoice over how good our worship songs are. And he's not going to rejoice over how good your preaching was. And he's not going to rejoice over how good your programs were. He's going to ask you, were you faithful with what I put into your hands? And did you call my wandering children back to me? He's coming back. And he's been patient. He's been slow on our account. That should weigh heavy on you. Now, if you feel completely blown up right now, blame Peter, the Holy Spirit, and Dr. Aiken. They all brought me here today. <laughs> Should have known what you're getting into. If you're not grieved like God, I want you to read it. I, I, I want you to go and do a study on God's heart toward the sinner. Open up John chapter 7, where Jesus stands up at the Feast of Booths and tells the men who are trying to kill him, come to me. I will fill you with living water. Go and look at it. Let, it. let it stir your soul. Because at the end of the day, when you have this degree, and I pray that you will, and you pastor a fantastic church, and I pray that you will, if you're not reaching the loss, you're not faithful. You're not faithful. You're not. And I truly believe, I truly believe that, the, that the, the, the greatest gift we have is right here in 1 Peter chapter 3. The reminder of God's glorious return. The reminder that God is coming back, the reminder that God will reclaim his world, the reminder that God will make broken, mended, the reminder that God will make shattered whole, the reminder that God will make uh, dirty, clean, the reminder that God will make everything renewed. But there's two sides to that renewal. There's two sides. And when that purifying fire comes, and I say purifying because I don't believe that God's going to destroy the world. I believe that it's going to be a purifying fire. It's going to burn away the chaff. It's the Old Testament allusion into the new. When that renewal happens, there are going to be people on one side of it. And there are going to be people on the other. And there are going to be people you deeply care about on the other. Now, the bottom line is we don't save anybody. But God in his infinite wisdom has chosen the proclamation of the gospel through frail and fragile people to be the means by which people come to him. So if you are reformed as I am, it's a cop-out to sit back and say that God is going to save who he's going to save. He's going to save who he's going to save through the proclamation of his salvation by those he's already saved. That's the bottom line. I say this with love. As Peter wrote it here, and we'll close here, verse 10. The day of the Lord, which in every Old Testament illusion is a day of judgment. 
every Old Testament illusion is a day of judgment, a day of reckoning. The day of the Lord, the day of God's return will come like a thief. It will be sudden and it will be abrupt. You will not be able to plan for it. You will not be able to set it aside on your calendar. You will not be able to make yourself ready. You will not be able to, to scramble and be generous with the gospel with all the people that you hoped you get to at some point. No, because it's going to be abrupt and it's going to be sudden. And everything we know will pass away with a loud noise. And everything we understand will be purified with fire. And everything on this planet will be exposed for its frailty. And all that will remain is what's wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. That's it. That's it. And the only way, the only way that any person now who is not walking with Jesus will be wrapped in that righteousness is if you are faithful, faithful to give them the good gift of good news that you received from someone else. God loves humanity. He created and he loves humanity. And he has been patiently withholding his return so that as many as possible will turn to him. But at some point, that waiting is going to cease. And all of this is going to come to a close. So knowing this, what, what do we do? How do we respond? I'm going to challenge you to two things today. The first is prayer. If you pray for, pe pray for people who don't believe in Jesus, God will burden your heart for them. If you pray for people who don't belong to Jesus, God will burden your heart for them. He will make you unable to sleep. I remember uh, for weeks before we planted our church, months really before we planted our church, every night, restless and weeping, restless and weeping at the state of my city, Number one in the nation in homosexuality. Number three in the nation in sex trafficking. Number three in the nation in homelessness. Top 10 in the nation in, 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 uh, in foster care and foster children. Do you know what causes those things? Sin and brokenness. <laughs> and you know what fixes those things? Not social programs, they're good. They're good. But government funding is not gonna change the heart of a woman who intends to murder her child in abortion. But the gospel will. Government funding is not gonna change the heart of a man who intends to sell a child into the sex trade, but the gospel will. And it doesn't mean those things are bad. And it doesn't mean we don't work for social good. Of course we work for social good. We fight social issues. But the engine and the energy behind our battle is the good news of Christ. And one of our greatest weapons is prayer. And the more I pray for Atlanta, the more restless I become about the state of its soul. And so that's the first thing I want to challenge you to is that you would pray. Pray that God would burden your heart for the unbelieving. That he would break you out of your Christianized inculcation and put you around some crazy people that will cuss you out if you tell them about Jesus. That will threaten you. I had a homeless man, I shared the gospel with him. He said, 
Jesus can't knock me down. And then, he, <laughs> and then he did a Michael Jackson dance. Share the gospel just so you can see that. Right? It was amazing. He did the whole thing. It was incredible. Ask God to burden you for the lost. Ask God to remind you of his imminent coming. That this world is not going to always be as it is. And that you can't allow yourself to be lulled to sleep. And the second thing I'm going to challenge you to do is, is follow that prayer with activity. Don't, don't go south in this. Southerners are good for telling you they're praying for you and doing very little. Well, bless your heart, baby. I'm going to pray for you. But I'm hungry right now. Yes, and we're going to ask God for a sandwich <laughs> and a hedge of protection. Can you just make me a bologna sandwich? Bless God, he is coming with provision. You know, it's... <laughs> Follow your prayer with action. Begin to surround yourself with people who don't know Jesus, who make you uncomfortable, who make you nervous, who, who rattle your cage, because they'll be the ones to also help remind you that God is coming back. And if he don't save this fool before he does, then this man, this woman, they'll never meet Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the good news of the gospel that even where I failed in this, grace says I'm free to try again. Grace says, I'm free to lean into you again. Grace says, you've already forgiven me for those failures. And the Holy Spirit says that you'll empower me to walk forward. God, that's my prayer for every one of us here who think and desire to be career ministers. Preaching is not evangelism. And I pray that you would stir our hearts for the lost. That you would send us into uncomfortable situations with uncomfortable people so that we can share the glory of good news. That God saves sinners. We love you. We ask for your help now in Christ's name. Amen.